Good afternoon. My name is uh, Brother Occult of Mon, and you're very welcome to our Lenten reflection um, this afternoon. The season of Lent is often presented as a journey, a passage from captivity to freedom, from light to darkness, from death to life. It reaches its climax in Holy Week during the days of the sacred Paschal Triduum, when we pass over from death to life in the company of the Lord Jesus. The scriptures of Lent, then, are full of the imagery of liberation, of journeying, of transitioning to new life and new enduring hope. Since the earliest days of the Church, since the earliest days, the, the Church has seen the experience of the Exodus as a foreshadowing of the Paschal mystery. Here, the people of Israel, led by Moses, are brought out from Egypt, from the land of slavery, and the shadow of death to the land that has been promised to them by their faithful and abiding God. The 40 years that they spend in the wilderness become for them a place of time or of a, a period of purification and renewal, during which they entered into an abiding covenant with God, and during which they forged their identity as God's holy people. It's not surprising then that when the first Christians in Ireland started to reflect on their own Passover from death to life, that they drew on the imagery of the Exodus story with St. Patrick, whose feast day we celebrate this week, being cast in the role of Moses. They even went so far as to claim that the pastoral staff or the crozier that the saint had once possessed had in fact belonged to Moses and had been given to Patrick by Christ himself in a vision. This staff, known as the Bachel Isa, was preserved as one of the principal relics of Christ Church Cathedral in Dublin until its destruction at the Reformation. Now, in the midst of all these pious legends, it's easy to lose sight of the 5th century British bishop, who is the reason for our celebrations during the week. The little actual knowledge that we have of him comes from two letters that he wrote in the course of his missionary work in the 5th century. In one, he fearlessly condemns a warlord who had carried off some of his converts into slavery. The other document, known as his confession, gives a moving account of his conversion and of his work as a minister of the gospel. Patrick was born into a comfortable middle-class family in Roman Britain. Like many of us, he took his family, his faith and his good fortune for granted. Like some of us, all of this was to change utterly and in an instant. In his case, when a group of Irish raiders captured him and sold him into slavery. Snatched from the comfort of his Roman villa, he found himself herding sheep and fending off wild animals on the side of an Irish mountain. Exiled, abused and exploited, Patrick turned to Christ in his desperation, and the relationship of faith that ensued transformed both his own life and the lives of countless Irish people ever since. Escaping from captivity, he returned to his family and eventually became a priest. He would perhaps have settled into a respectable clerical career like his father and grandfather had, had it not been for a dream, when he, a dream in which he heard the voice of the Irish begging him to come and walk once more among us. This he took as a summons to return and proclaim the freedom of Christ and the liberty of the gospel in the land of his captivity, and to the very people who had enslaved him. Now, if this were Hollywood, the story would end there. But because it's life, it doesn't. From Patrick's confession, we learn that his mission was anything but an easy one. He was subjected to threats, imprisonment and extortion. His converts were enslaved and brutalised. And most painfully of all, his own personal integrity was called into question by the church authorities themselves. 
for like many of us, Patrick had his dark secret. When aged about 15, he had committed a very serious crime. What the nature of this offence was, he does not reveal, but it would have been an impediment to his ordination had it been disclosed. He confessed this sin to a close friend, who subsequently betrayed his trust. In consequence, Patrick's entire mission was called into question, and the confession constitutes an anguished defence of his ministry in the face of his detractors. Now, all of this is a long way from the sanitised image of the saint, banishing the snakes from Ireland with his Kelly green vestments, bishop's staff and oversized shamrock. However, the reality of St. Patrick, as revealed in the Confession, shows us someone in whom the grace of God was powerfully active. The Lord, who casts down the mighty from their thrones and raises the lowly, habitually uses weak and fragile people to accomplish his will, to build up his kingdom. As St. Paul says, my grace is enough for you, my strength is made perfect in weakness. Patrick himself recognised this. He was very conscious of being rustic, exiled and unlearned, of lacking the sophistication of other bishops. But more than this, he was conscious of the power of God working within him. All of us are familiar with the stone-walled fields that partition the Irish countryside, and we can appreciate the image that he uses to describe this. I was like a stone lying in deep mud, and he that is mighty came, and in his mercy lifted me up, and raised me aloft, and put me on the top of the wall. Weak though he was, Patrick's triumph lay in his recognition of the gospel's power to transform, to transfigure, and to uplift weak and sinful people. And this is as relevant for us in the 21st century as it was for him in the 5th. Human nature means that every saint has a past. God's mercy assures us that every sinner has a future. One of my favourite stories, in fact, my favourite story, from the early legends that surround Patrick, has to do with his baptism of two women, who he meets at a well at the royal inauguration site of Crucha in Connacht. It's recorded in the 7th century by a man called Bishop Chiricon, and it goes as follows. Then the Holy Patrick came to the well called Tlaboc, on the, sh- on the slopes of Crocho to the east, before the sunrise, and sat beside the well. And behold, the two daughters of King Lyra, fair-haired Ethna and re- red-haired Fidelma, came to the well, as the women are wont to do in the morning, to wash. And they found the holy assembly of bishops with Patrick beside the well. And they did not know whence they were, or of what shape, or of what from, or of what, from what people, or region. But they thought they were men of the other world, or earth gods, or phantoms. And the women said to them, Where are you, and whence have you come? And Patrick said to them, It would be better for you to profess our true God than to ask us questions about our race. The first maiden said, Who is God, and where is God, and whose God is he, and where is his dwelling place? Has your God sons and daughters, gold and silver, Is he ever living? Is he beautiful? Have many fostered his sons? Are his daughters dear and beautiful in the eyes of the men of the earth? Is he in the sky or in the earth or in the water, in rivers, 
in mountains, in valleys. Give us an account of him. How shall he be seen? How is he loved? How is he found? Is he found in youth or in old age? Replying, Holy Patrick, filled with the Holy Spirit, said, Our God is the God of all men the God of heaven and and earth, of the sea and the rivers, God of the sun and the moon and all the stars, the God of high heavens and low valleys, God above heaven and in heaven and under heaven. He has his dwelling in heaven and earth and sea and in everything that is in them. He breathes in all things, makes all things live surpasses all things, supports all things. He illumines the light of the sun. He consolidates the light of the night and the stars. He has made wells in the dry earth and dry islands in the sea and stars for the service of the major lights. He has a sun co-eternal with him, similar to him. The sun is not younger than the father, nor the Father older than the Son, and the Holy Spirit breathes in them. The Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit are not not separate. Now I wish to join you to the heavenly King, since you are daughters of an earthly one, if you are willing to believe. And the maiden said as with one voice and one heart, Teach us with all diligence how we can believe in the heavenly King, so that we may see him face to face. Tell us, and we will do what you say. And Patrick said, Do you believe that through baptism you cast off the sin of your father and mother? They answered, We believe. Do you believe in penance after sin? We believe. Do you believe in life after death? Do you believe in the resurrection on the day of judgment? We believe. Do you believe in the unity of the church? We believe. And they were baptised with white garments being placed over their heads. This account of the baptism in the 6th century differs perhaps from our experience today. But it remains true that every age and every generation constitutes a new country, a new continent, and a new people to be one for Christ. Every age and every generation is the field in which the fragile mustard seed that is the kingdom of God must strike root. To do this in every age and in every generation God raises up men and women outstanding in holiness, who paradoxically are simultaneously inadequate, sinful and unprepared for the task entrusted to them. May we in our age and in our generation find the courage to be numbered in their company, so that we too may proclaim in the words of St. Patrick, I ought to shout aloud, and return something to the Lord for the great mercy he has shown me now and for all ages and to all generations.